Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. So today lecture is about cosmoceuticals or cosmoceutical formulation and characterization. Um, during this lecture and by the end you should be able to describe the evolution of the term cosmoceutical. Define what's meant by cosmeceuticals, describe the regulations of cosmeceuticals in Malaysia, US, and Europe, and Japan, and list different classes of cosmeceuticals. And we'll talk about the developments. We should be able to describe the steps involved in development of cosmeceuticals. So, if you notice or you look at this uh, term, cosmeceuticals, you can see that it is combined of, or it's it resulted from the merge of two words, which are cosmetics and pharmaceuticals. And this term was introduced in late 1970s by Albert Kligman at a meeting of the Society of Cosmetic Chemists and appeared in the world market in, by 1996. It's like quite a long time after it was introduced. And he defined cosmeceuticals as topical formulations. So they are mainly topical formulations, same as cosmetics. But they are neither pure cosmetics, like lipstick or rouge, means that they are not just to change the appearance. And they are not pure drugs, that they only have some um, treatment or curative effects like corticosteroids. So they are combination of both. And nowadays, this term cosmeceutical is generally used to refer to skincare products that contain active ingredients that are beneficial to improving skin's appearance and promoting healthy skin. So they are not just to give certain uh, beautification, uh, changing appearance, but they have also active ingredients. So that it is a cosmetics with, with added active ingredients that are beneficial to improving skin appearance. Okay, so cosmetics because at the end they are supposed to they are supposed to give cosmetic benefits. But we add pseudicals to refer to them as pharmaceuticals because of the presence of active ingredients that have some pharmacological effects that are beneficial to improving skin's appearance and promoting healthy skin. Okay, so nowadays the cosmetic industry or cosmetics industry uses the term cosmeceutical to refer to a cosmetic product with medicinal or drug-like benefits uh, as defined by FDA. Okay. In FDA, we have two separate definitions. Cosmetics have its own definition. Drugs has its own uh, have its own definition. Cosmetics are or cosmeceuticals. They are cosmetic product, but have uh, some active ingredients, as we mentioned. They are medicinal or drug uh, or act ingredients that have drug-like benefits, as defined by FDA. So let's have a look at the definition by. Um, Malaysian definition and also American definition we, we go through. Um, so for FDA first, the Federal uh, Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act defines drugs as articles intended for use in the diagnosis, cure, mitigation, treatment or prevention of disease and articles other than food intended to affect the structure or any function of the body of man or other animals. Um, mostly for cosmeceuticals, it will be about the last part, affect the structure or mainly structure of the body of man. Okay. 
But in, in this act, cosmetics were defined as articles intended to be rubbed, poured, sprinkled, or sprayed on, introduced into, or otherwise applied to the human body, or any part thereof for cleansing, beautifying, promoting attractiveness, or altering the appearance. Okay, so mainly they are giving for beautification purpose, and mostly they are, as you can see here from the methods of administration, mostly they are topical. Okay, the examples given in this definition are skin moisturizers, perfumes, lipsticks, fingernail polishes, eye and facial makeup preparations, cleansing shampoos, permanent waves, hair colors, deodorants, as well as any substances intended for use as a component of a cosmetic, a cosmetic product. Okay. In Malaysia, the Malaysian definition, uh, as by the Drug and the Cosmetics uh, Sales Act, uh, define drug as any substance, product, or article intended to be used or capable or purported or claimed to be capable of being used on humans or any animal, whether internally or externally for a medicinal purpose. So for drug, then it is used internally or external, externally for medicinal purpose. For cosmetics, they are defined as being topical only. Any substance or preparation intended to be placed in contact with the various external parts of the human body, including epidermis, hair, system, nails, lips, and external genital organs, or with the teeth and the mucous membranes of the oral cavity, like gargle, for example, with a view exclusively or mainly to clean them, perfume them, change their appearance, or correcting body odors, or protecting them or keeping them in a good condition. So, if you go back to the FDA definition, you will find about introduced into human body or any part thereof. Okay. And the applicate the as you see here, mostly they are topical preparations. Here also, it is mostly about topical formulations intended uh, to be applied for external parts or external genital organs. So, for example, if you talk about vaginal wash, for example, it is still considered cosmetic because applied to the external genital organ. It's different from uh, those to be applied internally. Okay, uh, so when, when it comes to the regulations, the regulations that doesn't identify the term cosmeceutical. So it either, you have to classify your product either to cosmetic, as cosmetic or as drug, and based on this, you follow the respective regulations. Okay, generally, Cosmetics were not under regulation in U.S. until there were cases of blindness in 1930. Uh, regulations for cosmetics and cosmeceuticals are in place worldwide to ensure their safety, efficacy, and quality nowadays. And they may have slight differences from country to another. Nowadays, there is a committee that combines several countries. They discuss together regulations, so they come into harmonized regulations so that there will be some similarity between countries when it comes to regulations regarding cosmeceuticals or cosmetics. Uh, this committee is called International Cooperation on Cosmetic Regulations, ICCR, established in 2007, uh, including several countries. It is a voluntary group of cosmetic regulatory authorities from Brazil, Canada, Chinese, Taipei, European Union, Japan, Republic of Korea, and the United States of America. They meet on an annual basis to discuss several topics related to cosmetic safety and regulations. Okay. As we mentioned, neither FDA nor other regulatory bodies recognize the term cosmeceutical, and it has no meaning under the law. Okay. So it either 
you have to categorize the product as per FDA or even other um, other agencies, regulatory bodies. They categorize the products either as cosmetics or drugs according to their intended use. We will mention the criteria later on. And based on this, you should follow the uh, related regulations. Usually, cosmetics require less rigorous pre-approval process and has no new drug application. Okay, and no new drug application is necessary. Okay. And we can show some examples how to define the product or how to categorize the product as cosmetic or cosmeceutical. So, for example, here you have two types of shampoo. Dove is just only for cleansing the skin, the hair. But head and shoulders intended to have some therapeutic benefit, which is anti-dandruff shampoo, right? So the shampoo, like Dove, is a cosmetic because it is intended to use, because the intended use is to clean the hair. But when you talk about anti-dandruff treatment, in this one, we consider it as drug because its intended its intended use is to treat dandruff. Hence, the anti-dandruff shampoo is both cosmetic and a drug. So in this case, how it would be registered? It would be registered as a drug. Such products must comply with the requirements for both cosmetics and drugs. Usually, will be registered as a um, OTC drug. Okay. So when it comes to regulation and licensing of cosmeceuticals in the United States, this implies that a subclass of drugs, cosmeceuticals, are registered similarly as over-the-counter products because the law doesn't recognize this class as cosmeceuticals. So you have active ingredients included and you claim some therapeutic benefits, then it should be registered as a drug. But because of the nature of the active ingredients present, then it's, it can be registered as over-the-counter products or what we call OTC uh, products, okay? Clinical studies with adequate power should be essential to demonstrate the intended activity of the cosmeceutical for the treatment of the particular minor skin disorder or condition, and there must be an assurance that the safety requirements are optimal and that there are no expected side effects. So now we have therapeutic claims. So we must run clinical study and we have to try this medication and we should um, prove that it, it's effective for treatment of the condition we claim it is effective for treatment of. Okay? And this study should have adequate power. Power is the ability of the study to detect the effect. And it depends on sample size. So there must be an adequate number of subjects enrolled in the study and we try the medicine on them in order to detect the effect of the medicine. Okay, usually we have to compare to another group like group receiving placebo, for example, only the um, excipients of the formulation without the active ingredient. Okay, and we should compare the effect of both the formulation with active ingredient and the formulation without active ingredient, yeah, without active ingredient. And we don't only monitor the effect, but also we monitor the side effects and we need to uh, prove um, safety as well. So we want to prove from this study efficacy and safety of the product. Um, when it comes to manufacturing of these products, uh, it is a requirement or advised that um, the manufacturing plant should be GMP certified. So manufacturing should follow GMP, uh, GMP manufacturing practices in order to reduce the risk of misbranding or mislabel mislabeling. Um, GMP guidelines include, as you know, pr production practices, label placement, placement of information on labels, and how to list ingredients and other details. <clears throat> okay, so how about in Malaysia here? What is the regulation? Uh, that uh, rule or govern the production of cosmetics. We have here some conditions or some requirements that you cannot 
to register your product as cosmetic if contains a substance listed in the poison list. So number one, if you have any active ingredient that is from the poison list, means an, 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 a product or a, an API, an active ingredient that known to have pharmacological effect and included in the poison list, then you cannot register it as cosmetics. So what will you do? You register it as drug and maybe classified as O2C drug, same as we mentioned about US. And also there are some requirements when it comes to the ingredients in the, the excipients themselves. They should not ex uh, contain any substances listed in Annex 2, Annex 3, above certain limits. Um, not having any coloring agents other than those listed in Annex 4. This is, um, these annexes are for in the guidelines for sale of, cosmetic, of cosmetics. <clears throat> guidelines for cosmetics. Uh, Malaysian guidelines. So they have several annexes. Um, and then, annex number four is about the coloring agents permitted to be used in cosmetics. So it should not be containing any coloring agent other than those in annex number four, with the exception of cosmetic products containing coloring agents intended solely for hair coloring. So for hair coloring, you can have other ingredients. Uh, and also should not, these coloring agents should not be used outside the conditions laid down in this annex. Again, with the exception of those coloring agents used for hair, for hair coloring as hair dyes. And not allowed also to be registered as cosmetics if it contained preservatives other than those listed in Annex 6. So Annex 6 contained the permitted preservatives to be used in cosmetics. You cannot use other than them. And you cannot use also in beyond the specified limits that are mentioned in this annex or outside the stated conditions. Okay. And UV filters other than those listed in Annex 7 and UV filters listed in Annex 7 beyond the limits means when you talk about limits here, we talk about amounts. You cannot use them in amounts more than the amounts stated in this annex. Okay, so they have permissible amounts there in the annex. You can refer to the guideline for control of cosmetic products in Malaysia. Uh, it is available in this link. You can, after lecture, you can have a look and see the guidelines in detail. Okay, so this is the decision tree or decision process. If you want to register some product and you don't know whether you can register it as cosmetic or drug, then you follow this algorithm or decision process, decision tree. Then you can identify which category it, it, it falls under. Okay. So the first question will be about uh, the composition. Does the product contain only ingredients permitted by the ACD? No ingredients banned by the ACD? Okay. So ACD here is the Asian Cosmetic Directive. They, they refer to it. So most ingredients that are permissible by this directive and you can find them in the annexes from two to seven, as we mentioned. If nothing outside this list or these annexes, then should be okay. So it doesn't contain, it contain only ingredients permitted. So if yes, we go to the next question. If no, then you cannot register as cosmetic. Should be registered as drug. Number two, uh, the target site, is it for external application or for internal? So if it is, the product is intended for contact with the various external parts of human body, as in the definition of cosmetics that we mentioned earlier, then it can be registered as cosmetics. Just we move to the next question. But if no, it is, a, for example, need to be applied internally, then cannot be registered as a cosmetic. Okay, the next question about the main function. Do we have any therapeutic claims or just for cleansing, perfuming, or changing the appearance, or correcting body odors. 
If it is only for these indications, no therapeutic claims, then it still can be registered as cosmetics. But if no, they have any therapeutic claims, then it's not a cosmetic. Next question will be about non-cosmetic presentation. Is the product presented as treating or preventing disease in human beings? If there is any therapeutic claim, there should be no therapeutic claim. If no, then we go ask about the function. But if yes, then it is not considered as cosmetic. Non-cosmetic function, does the product permanently restore, correct, or modify physiological function by exerting a pharmacological, immunological, or metabolic action should be no also, then it can be registered as a cosmetic product. But if yes, then it is treated as drug. Okay. So we give examples from Malaysian cosmetic guidelines about sometimes the same product category, but different uh, classification as cosmetic or as drug. For example, here hand sanitizers. If they are used for general hand hygiene, they are classified as cosmetic products. But if they are used in hospitals as hand sanitizers or disinfectant or hand surgical scrubs, then they are used uh, in healthcare facilities, as you mentioned. Uh, and for healthcare practitioners, before or after a, medicine, a medical procedure, then they are classified as generic medicine. Um, should be non-scheduled. Non-scheduled poison, considered as non-scheduled poison or over-the-counter medication. Okay. So these are examples of cosmeceutical products. Toothpastes that, contains, that contain fluoride. Deodorants that are also antiperspirant. Moisturizers and makeup marketed with sun protection claims an eye cream that contains special ingredient to potentially regenerate cells or boost collagen production. So we have additional therapeutic claims here, okay? Essential oil that claims to promote better sleep. So we're talking about pharmacological effect. A gel that both, uh, that both moisturizes skin, this is just a cosmetic, but relieve muscle or joint pain, then we talk about treatment or therapeutic benefit or claim. So here, hence it became, here it became, uh, it became drug. A mascara containing a serum. If you talk about mascara only, it is a cosmetic, but if it contains a serum to encourage eyelash growth, then we're talking about a drug. A face cream with vitamin C to prevent wrinkles. If you have therapeutic claim that it prevents wrinkles, then you must prove it. It is registered as drug in this case. Okay. There is a similar similar regulations in Japan, but they call them quasi drugs. They don't use the term OTC. In Japan, cosmeceuticals registered as quasi drugs, which differentiates them from regular cosmetic products. Quasi drugs they are not as strong as drugs, but their efficacy is recognized by authorizing constitutions. They contain ingredients with recognized effects, such as whitening or skin correction. They have certain limitations to how much of the ingredient can be added to the formulation. And examples are deodorants, depilatories, hair growth treatments, hair dyes, perm and straightening products. Um, you know, perm is the one that make waving, make the, the hair wavy. Straightening products make the hair straight, as well as medicated cosmetics. Uh, such as whitening products, anti-aging products, and oily skin or acne treatment products. Uh, depilatories, they are preparations to remove hair. Depilatories, preparations to remove hair. Okay. The market of cosmeceuticals is actually growing. And it's projected to grow from $54 billion in 2022, in 2022 uh, to almost double, $96 billion by 2029, uh, at annual growth rate of about 8.4% in forecast period in this period from 2022 to 2029. Skincare segment dominated in 2021. Anti-aging segment special injectables exhibited the fastest growth. 
Okay. Um, so you can see here the segments. 61.9% is for skin care products, the majority dominated. And then comes after this the hair care uh, injectables and others. You can see here the sales market in Asia Pacific region, the growth over years. It's, it's growing and projected to grow further up till 2028 20, or 2029. Okay. So, as we mentioned, there is no single accepted classification of cosmeceuticals. So, they may be classified as drugs or cosmetics based on their chief etiological indication means the condition for which a person would use them or based on their source of biochem or biochemical structure okay so as we mentioned if they have active ingredients or they have therapeutic claims then they should be registered as drugs okay uh, what are the indications of cosmeceuticals available in the market nowadays there are several indications including anti-aging in general uh, treatment of photomelanosis and phototanning, the, the patches or pigment hyperpigmentation uh, as patching or as uniform in the skin. Treatment of pigmentation related disorders like melasma or freckles. You know, melasma will be like patches of dark skin, freckles, you know, freckles. And righted reduction, it's like wrinkles. Anti-inflammatory, used for fat loss, for treatment of obesity, to stimulate hair growth, prevent hair fall, and for maintenance of skin tone and clarity of complexion. Uh, maintenance of skin tone means you want firm skin, not wrinkled one. And clarity of complexion means clear skin. Clear skin. Okay. So, when it, these are the different classes when it comes to skin care. They're anti-aging products, skin whitening products, sun protection products, professional skin care products, anti-acne, uh, professional skin products that are used in, by dermatologists in, in salon here in skin care salons, and anti-acne products and others. Hair care is hair growth products, anti-dandruff and others. Injectables like botulinum toxin that is used for, uh, that we call it Botox. Mostly you hear about Botox. This is the botulinum toxin. And some dermal fillers and others. Uh, and then others like lip care products, tooth whitening, anti-cellulite, body slimming, and oral care. Okay. They can be available in different uh, dosage forms or different formulation types. Can be available as powder. Cream, emulsion, liquid, stick, or other dosage forms. These are the main categories of active ingredients that may be available in cosmeceuticals. Epidermal growth factors, skin brighteners, peptides, botanicals, retinoids, antioxidants, sunscreens, and hydroxy acids. We will mention them one by one. So when it comes to sunscreens, they are used to prevent damage to the skin from the sun's UV rays. So they prevent the passage of UV rays to the skin. They are applied topically on the skin as lotions or um, solutions. Um, examples are zinc oxide and titanium dioxide. And the majority of those you can find in the market, they contain titanium. Site. Okay, then antioxidants. There are a lot of antioxidants available. Their function is to clear the skin of the oxides which build up over time from sun exposure, pollution, smoking, uh, and going about daily life. So they protect the skin from also sun damage, reduce inflammation and redness and they regulate skin tone and pigmentation. The examples like alpha lipoic acid, vitamin C, vitamin B3, vitamin E, dead palm extract also have 
a good antioxidant effect. Curcuminoids, which are taken from turmeric, uh, cystein, cysteines like in acetyl cystein, res uh, reservatrol, and coenzyme Q10, which is also called as ubiquinone. They are all used as antioxidants, and you can find them in some cosmeceutical preparations for uh, skin care. Some botanicals that also have antioxidant or moisturizing effect are also included in um, in cosmeceutical skincare products. They may be taken from uh, different extracts from different parts of the plants, like leaves, uh, bark, flowers, roots, stems, and fruits. Examples are aloe vera, coconut extract, green tea extract, witch hazel, uh, ferulic acid available in several many plants, and silmarine. Peptides are also used to repair and regulate process surrounding skin aging. They are used as anti-glycation agent. Talk about glycation, it is about glucose, especially those with high glucose uh, uh, levels. The glucose may bind to the um, proteins, the amino group of the proteins in the skin or in the body, and they cause, this will cause the metabolic syndrome the manifestations of metabolic syndrome, this mechanism of it, glycation of proteins. So these peptides are anti-glycation agents, so they are protective. And they also act as building blocks for collagen and elastin. Okay, so examples, so in general, they work as uh, anti-aging products. They work as anti-aging products, okay? Examples are um, the peptide that is called copper GHK, peptide bound to copper. And GHK is the uh, abbreviation of amino acids that constitute it. Okay. Uh, SH polypeptide 51, agrelin, uh, matrixyl 3000, and palmitoyl peptide 38. They are all peptides that have anti-glycation and anti-aging effect. And they are also building blocks of collagen and elastin. So they help also to uh, keep the skin tone. Okay. Retinoids, which are vitamin A derivatives mainly, like retinol, retinaldehyde, and retinoin, they encourage skin cell turnover. Okay. And when you say turnover, means replacement of old cells with new cells. So you know the, the process of the, the life cycle of uh, skin, uh, the epidermis of the skin, that you have uh, um, cells that will die, they will form keratin and then uh, replaced by new cells. So this one encourages the skin cell turnover. Um, and this will also give this, the skin a fresh appearance, looks like fresh skin. Um, it will have nice appearance, like young, the person using it will look, the person using it will look younger. And uh, it reduces wrinkles and fine lines, improve skin texture and regulate pigmentation. Um, ingredients that may be included in cosmeceuticals are skin bright. Brighteners means they make the skin color lighter or brighter. So they regulate skin pigmentation to reduce dark spots and discoloration. And they act mainly on melanin pathways, some of them natural, some of them synthetic. Natural like licorice extract or vitamin C, azelaic acid, kojic acid, arbutine, hydroquinone, and hydroxy anisole. Like hydroquinone is synthetic. So Cosmeceutical ingredients, if they are intended to uh, be used for whitening, skin whitening, then they may contain one of these agents. Um, hydroxy acids are also used, and they are divided into uh, three categories, alpha hydroxy acids, polyhydroxy acids, and beta hydroxy acids. They improve skin texture by exfoliation and skin cell turnover. So they exfoliate the skin, they remove the keratin layer and the dead cells, 
so the skin will have a fresh appearance, okay? Look younger, the person who's using it. They reduce signs of aging in the skin and they hydrate skin cells as well. Examples are lactic acid, glycolic acid, malic acid, they are alpha hydroxy acids. Uh, polyhydroxy acids like gluconolactone, beta hydroxy acids like salicylic acid. Okay. Another class is epidermal growth factors. Epidermal growth factors stimulate from their name. They stimulate the growth of epidermal cells. So they are used for treatment of burns and excision wounds. It accelerates re-epithelialization, formation of epithelial cells and healing of the wounds or uh, healing of burns. Okay. Um, there is also transforming growth factor, TGF. This stimulates normal skin growth and cellular growth and repair. Exerts positive regulatory effects on the accumulation of the body's extracellular matrix protein and mediator of fibrosis, which is the process used for repair of uh, skin. Okay, this is the repair tissue. If you have a cut wound or damage in the skin or any organ, then usually the repair is by formation of fibrous tissue. Okay. And it is also a mediator of angiogenesis. This uh, healing and new tissue formation is, uh, there will be also a growth of new uh, blood supply, blood vessels. This is the process of angiogenesis, development of new blood cells and blood vessels as well. So it promotes the healing of wounds. Cosmeceuticals that are produced for hair growth stimulation um, may contain hair growth stimulants. For example, minoxidil. We know minoxidil is mainly used as, uh, or was introduced first as antihypertensive drug, but they found also that it has a side effect, a beneficial side effect, that is, it stimulates the hair growth. So now it is available in some topical applications to be applied to the skull uh, in the form of sprays, for example, containing minoxidil. Okay, so minoxidil or minoxidil related compounds. Uh, they, the mechanism is by stimulation of the microcirculation around the hair follicles uh, by introducing arterial, uh, arterial vasodilation to so encourage conditions conductive to hair growth. For some ingredients that are anti-dandruff, um, they are available in some OTC products. Examples of these ingredients, selenium sulfide, uh, zinc uh, pyrethone, and um, kaffir lime. This is a natural one, uh, fruit, uh, that essential oil of it have some effects on the, the organisms that are it's not candida albicans, actually, that, that cause, is known to cause dandruff. It's another yeast. But in general, this will work by two mechanisms for reducing the dandruff. Number one is by being cytostatic agents. So they reduce the epidermal cell turnover. So they, they, they reduce the, for, the formation of dead cells that will form scales. And second, by inhibiting the yeast that is uh, um, associated with the dandruff of the skull. Okay, inhibit the growth of the yeast that is associated with the uh, dandruff in the skull. Um, last ingredients we we'll mentioned that are available in cosmeceuticals are ceramides. Ceramides are lipids that are naturally actually available in the skin. They are found in skin cells and are essential for normal stratum corneum water barrier. Uh, incorporated into the intracellular lipid of stratum corneum to replace the depletion that occurs with aging and environmental damage such as um, 
from surfactant exposure. So by this mechanism, uh, they, they, they exert their effect on the skin. What's the effect? They reduce water loss from skin in creams, uh, prevent dryness, useful in skin conditions like eczema. So to summarize, these lipids naturally, naturally available in the skin cells, and they are uh, they form the natural water barrier in the stratum corneum. So means that they prevent the dryness of the skin and uh, prevent uh, its damage. So once we have ceramide in the cosmocytical formulation, it will be incorporated into the intracellular, uh, intercellular lipid of the stratum corneum. It will restore this uh, lipid, uh, this water barrier, and it will prevent the water loss. And it is here useful in some conditions like eczema, which is uh, it has significant drying of the skin and also um, stimulated or exaggerated by skin dryness. Okay. There are different types of uh, ceramides. We call them ceramide one, two, uh, six, nine, and uh, phytosphingosine and sphingosine. Okay. Uh, here we can have a five minutes break, and then we continue the second part of the lecture.
Uh, can we resume? Do you hear me? Hello? Assalamu alaikum. Okay. So now let's talk about the development of cosmeceuticals and we start from left to right. So usually it starts with consumer needs and insights research. So we research, we do research. What does the consumer need? So based on this, we develop the product. We have to look for regulatory and legal considerations and uh, what are the permissible ingredients to be used at which levels, what active ingredient can be used at which levels and so on. And then we start to develop the product. The first formulation we develop, we call it prototype. So prototype is the initial formulation that will still be evaluated and may be improved to get the final formulation. There will be some toxicology, safety, and stability evaluation. Um, first is theoretical. We refer to literature. We have we collect information about our the ingredients we use, uh, permissible amounts to be used, and so on. And then will be some experimental uh, approach like in vitro animal studies and human studies at the end. And then we should choose the appropriate package for the product. And then we give samples for volunteers to test it, to use it at home, and uh, fill in questionnaire about this product. Then we should develop the manufacturing process, which the the, the process that we call it as scale up. And then we conduct the final stability study. During the prototype development, there should be, of course, some stability evaluation. But the one for registration of the product and for to submit the data for regulatory authorities is the final stability study after the scale up. And then some clinical testing can be done if it is to be registered as an, an OTC or non-scheduled poison. Um, then we can go for manufacturing and quality control and product launch. Okay. We discuss, discuss or explain these steps one by one. Number one is the consumer needs and insights research. Here formulations with pleasant aesthetics, usually known to have higher acceptance by consumers not too oily, not too sticky. Uh, for example, lotions and sprayable lotions. So usually we should go for these um, formulations. An example of this is the sunscreen. Sunscreen products at the beginning were oily formulations. Uh, and with increasing the, the concentration of the UV, um, filter that will prevent the UV light. Usually formulations then, um, tended to be more oily and more sticky, which um, usually consumers don't like. So by surveying the consumers, they found that um, no, this is not the appropriate dosage form or formulation. So this guided them to formulated is in the form of lotions and sprayable lotions, which is more favorable by, by consumers. Um, another thing is the, the consistency or the, how does these emulsions feel? So they found that lipids and, and lipid containing formulations, such as emulsions, they have an immediate impact on the skin feel during and after product application. You remember the, the lotion we made in the practicals in the lab uh, and how does it feel before addition of sterile alcohol? 
So when you add the sterile alcohol, which is uh, lipid um, in nature, the feeling is different. Okay, it feels better and feels nice once you rub on the skin. Uh, so it has a better sensory feeling or sensory properties. So that's why these are usually encouraged to be added because um, uh, it 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 um, creates a better sensory uh, a better feeling upon application. So it's favored by the consumers. The optimal combination of lipids is crucial to create a formulation with attractive sensory properties. Okay. Second thing is looking at regulatory and re legal considerations. So, for example, the product composition will, and if there is any therapeutic claims, so it will be categorized based on the intended use and claims and labeling uh, as drug or as a cosmetic, and also the manufacturing regulations should be taken into consideration, like should be in a GMP environment as per regulations. Okay. Um, the product category as cosmetic or drug is defined by the, as we mentioned earlier in the earlier slides, by the claimed or intended use, and in some cases the product composition. Does it contain active ingredient uh, in the poison list or no? Okay. Or does it contain any ingredients like coloring agents, preservatives, and so on, other than those listed in the cosmetics guideline or will be used in higher amounts compared to those permitted in the cosmetic guidelines, then this composition may uh, um, lead to registration of the product as drug, not as cosmetic. Registration, manufacturing, and labeling requirements depends on the product category and the developed Product, we, we will discuss this in more detail in the, manufa um, in the manufacturing uh, pharmacy subject. Uh, what is the requirement for registration and so on. Um, or even here, we'll have some, also some information in this subject as well. Okay, the developed product should not infringe the patient, the patent rights belonging to other developers. So if you have a product that is patented already, so you should not infringe the patent rights belonging to other manufacturers or companies. So there is a World Trade ag ag Agreement uh, that many countries signed this agreement, including Malaysia. And for some patent, uh, especially medicines, usually you cannot produce without license. Um, before 20 years from the, the patent uh, registration. So if after 20 years, you can make a similar product. Otherwise, you cannot. Okay. So you have to conduct a patent search first before you start to develop your product so that you don't consume time and resources. At the end, you cannot register because of infringement of patent rights. Okay. So a patent search should be conducted first. And if your product is not patented, there is no similar patented product or patented, but already the patent expired, then you can produce. Uh, as we mentioned, cosmeceuticals are normally, normally registered as OTC products. Um, actually, we can refer to some uh, guidelines. For example, FDA, they published monographs that stipulate the rules and requirements for manufacture and marketing of many OTC drug products. For example, you have a guideline for skin protectants, you have a guideline for sunscreens, you have a guideline for acne products, you have a guideline for external analgesics, means topical analgesics, and so on. So if you want to prepare a, or develop a product from one of these categories, you can refer to the respective guidelines. It has uh, some instructions or recommendations regarding, regarding the approved active ingredients that can be used and the percentage in which amounts you can use them and will be registered as OTC products and the labeling instructions or labeling requirements what should be written on the labels, indications, warning, directions and allowable claims, what claims or therapeutic benefits you can claim. Um, 
<clears throat> of course, for those related to drugs, they are more extensive compared to those required for cosmetics. Um, you can refer to this link and you can to see what how how the guideline looks like. So this is a, a, a monograph for topical acne drug products for over-the-counter human use. Um, you can refer to this guideline and you can see uh, the uh, instructions or recommendations in this document. Okay. Then once everything is okay, we decide upon the uh, nature of the product, the type of the product, the, and the active ingredient that uh, should be used and the intended use and so on. And we make patent search. It's not patented. We can go ahead and produce. Then we go for prototype development. We decide on the composition. We identify. We test and we select the efficacious, the efficacious ingredients that impart a broad spectrum of skin benefits with no or minimal irritation to skin. So you want them to produce the intended benefits and not to, not to be irritant. Um, when it comes to the formula base that you want to choose, uh, and the, for example, you want to produce lotion, you want to produce aqueous lotion, alcoholic lotion, a solution, uh, or uh, you have you want to produce emulsion, cream, and so on. Number one, you want it to be compatible uh, with the active ingredient. Compatible with the active ingredients means it doesn't lead to degradation of the active ingredient or precipitation or change the form of it that it will not be um, bioavailable and will not produce effect. So compatible means it keeps the active stable in the base over the defined shelf life. And second thing, it should allow the intended drug release upon application on skin, either to stay on skin or to penetrate on to, uh, the skin, depending on what is the purpose of the formulation. Okay, You may have some penetration enhancers in the formulation, for example, if you wanted to penetrate to the deeper uh, layers of skin. Okay, And in the prototype development, you should make a formulation, you should do the process of formulation using the suitable modern techniques to optimize by availability and efficacy of the active ingredient. We can use some solubilization techniques like liposomes, emulsions, whether micro or nano emulsions. Use of materials like cyclodextrins, which solubilize lipophilic drugs in aqueous media. You can use formulations in the form of solid lipid nanoparticles, for example, or, um, as I mentioned, micro and nano emulsions. You can select suitable package that keep the product stable. You, in this stage, also, you should decide which packaging you want to use because the final stability study should be done in the final packaging. Okay, You should prove uh, that the product is stable in the final packaging with the final formulation composition. Uh, so it depends on the nature of your, uh, your active ingredients. For example, oxygen sensitive active ingredient, then you should include uh, antioxidant ingredient in the base. And you better use also oxygen impermeable package that is so, so that you keep the product stable. Okay. Uh, main ingredients to make the base depends on the formulation you want to use. For example, you want to make emulsion, then we're talking about lipids and surfactants to um, emulsify these lipids into the aqueous vehicle. And you can use some thickeners to give the required consistency as lotion or as cream. Uh, if you want to make it as a gel formulation, then you want the gel components are the polymers or gelling agent that once you um, um, dissolve or mix with the vehicle, water or non or, or alcoholic vehicle, for example, uh, they will form the gel matrix uh, or gel network okay, that solidify. You may need to add preservatives to prevent microbial spoilage of the formulation, especially when we talk about skin cream 
or skincare products, they are usually having uh, water as one of the constituents, and this will encourage the growth of um, microbes. We may need to have antioxidants, as we mentioned, to stabilize the ingredients susceptible to oxidation. We may have some chelating agents to capture traces of certain metal ions that work as pre-oxidants. So in this case, we prevent the breakdown and oxidation of uh, active ingredients and prevent discolorations. Uh, we can add organic acids in order to regulate uh, the pH and the appropriate pH for skin preparations is usually from 4 to 7. Fragrances can be added to give a pleasant scent or odor to the formulation. Colors also may be added to enhance the product aesthetics, uh, the appearance or the look of the product. And then toxicological evaluation may be done as we, should be done as we mentioned earlier in the steps. So first theoretically that you review the toxicological profile of each ingredient. You evaluate the risk of uh, application of this ingredient to healthy human skin under normal and foreseeable use conditions. Uh, determine whether critical ingredients, for example, UV filters, preservatives, and colorants might become systemically available. Is there any systemic absorption? And uh, in this case, do they produce harmful effects? What is the safe levels uh, for these ingredients to be used and so on? So evaluate the data um, from literature and you can create the margin of safety and then use in amounts that are safe. And uh, the sources of these toxicological data can be uh, risk evaluations published by Cosmetic Ingredient Review Committee in the US and can be the European Commission Scientific Committee for Cosmetic Products in European Union and can be by doing some studies in-house, in-house testing data and expertise. So based on the data generated in-house by studies conducted by the manufacturer or the developer of the formulation. Okay, so this, the stages for safety evaluation is three or four you can say uh, three stages mainly, or four stages. Number one is preliminary safety testing. This one to, to provide a preliminary judgment about the tolerability of a skin composition of materials on intact healthy skin. Okay, so we made it. And this finally needs to be confirmed by appropriate testing on human volunteers. So you start, as I mentioned earlier, by in vitro. Uh, test methods or by animal testing and once confirmed to be safe then we can try it on human volunteers. On human volunteers we can make the skin tolerance and compatibility testing so we perform it on human volunteers we want to assess the skin tolerance after a single application and also after repeated applications so in this study we apply the formulation to human skin to humans on their skin and then we look for the uh, signs of uh, sensitivity reactions and so on. If no sensitivity or hypersensitivity reactions, then it is tolerable by human skin. Okay. There will be microbiology evaluations. Uh, this one to test the efficacy of product preservation. We want to see if the preservative used in the product is effective. So what to do? Then we have to do microbiological challenge tests. So we take specimens, samples from the product, and we inoculate them with test microorganisms, bacteria, mold, and yeast. And we leave them in uh, suitable conditions for the growth of these microorganisms. For example, 37 degrees usually used for bacteria, in some protocols for fungi, we use uh, 25 degrees, sometimes above 30. Uh, anyway, we leave them for the appropriate time, about mostly 48 hours. And then we determine the micro microorganism counts in the culture. And um, um, if the counts, uh, what do you call it, um, exceed the acceptable limit, then it fails. 
if it doesn't exceed the number of colonies that are acceptable, then it is uh, it is uh, pass the test. Okay. Then a stability test we will mention in later slide. Okay. So here we explain uh, the skin tolerance and compatibility testing. As you see here in this photo, we have patches. Okay. These patches we will put. Uh, a small amount of the product on the inner side of the patch. So usually we follow standardized protocols uh, to evaluate the potential for cumulative contact irritancy or allergic sensitization. We want to see if they will cause sensitivity or hypersensitivity reactions. They cause allergy. And also we may expose them to some light UV exposure to see if there are any phototoxic responses or sun-induced allergic sensitization. Okay, so a specific volume of the product is applied on the inner side of occlusive or semi-occlusive patch as you see here in the photo and then this patch is applied to the skin. So here in this patch you have one, two, three, four, five, six, maybe more spots. We apply the product on them and then we put on the skin and then we examine the skin after we remove the patch, after specified time depends on the protocol, the patch is removed and the skin site is clinically graded for objective irritation. And the irritation from small to higher irritation is erythema, which is just redness, or formation of papules, pustules, bully, and weeping. Uh, weeping will have leakage of plasma. Okay. Subsequent patch is applied to the same site. If, if we want to see if there is allergy with repeated administration, then not only one dose, but for one application, you do so, repeated applications, okay? If we want to see the photo uh, toxic responses, then we have to uh, expose the skin to UV light. Uh, this will be, uh, after applying the, the product, it will be included in the protocol. Stability testing, then as we mentioned, stability, the final stability testing is that we conduct on the product in the final packaging uh, and we want to ensure chemical and physical stability. Okay. So we have to store them in uh, appropriate uh, storage conditions when it comes to mo uh, moisture and temperature, humidity and temperature. And then we will look for the chemical and physical stability indicators of the product. Uh, stability studies are two types, long-term and accelerated stability studies. So long-term st stability study is uh, at normal temperature that you expect to store your product at. For example, supposed to be uh, stored uh, at room temperature, then you can conduct uh, for example, in a country like Middle East countries at 25 degrees, in a country like Malaysia probably at 30 degrees, okay? And then you may also do some light exposure tests. You do some freeze to cycles. Um, this is not usually required for, um, for uh, products that will be kept at room temperature. Okay, light exposure to see if it is uh, stable at light by uh, upon exposure to light or no. If no, then the package must be uh, must protect the product from light. For example, use amber glass or dark containers. Short term stability study we call it accelerated stability study. We usually expose them to higher higher temperature and higher higher humidity. Okay. Um, the end result of stability study is that we determine the shelf life. Shelf life is the duration at which the product is stable, means still keeping the chemical and physical characteristics. There is no degrad significant degradation and there is no change in the physical appearance. For example, you have emulsion, then emulsion still as it is. It didn't uh, have any emulsion problems like cracking or coalescence or okay, uh, such problems. Uh, physical properties like viscosity, still no significant change. Colors, no significant change. Odor, texture, pH, and particle size, or droplet size when we, when we talk about the emulsion. And uh, when you talk about chemical uh, stability, then you talk about the analysis of active ingredients. 
and you find that there is no significant change in the potency. So if the strength is started uh, with 100% of the labeled uh, amount, then uh, there should be no significant degradation. If pharmacopoeia say, for example, or your specification say that shelf life is the period at which the product will not have degradation more than 10%, will not below 90%, then uh, you just follow during the stability study, you make a determination of the content. And then once the, the time period for the content to decrease to 90% is the, uh, this duration is the shelf life of the product. Okay, as long as other properties like physical properties also did not uh, change. So shelf life in general is um, <clears throat> is the duration at which the product keeps or retains uh, no significant physical or chemical change. Okay. Then we go to the packaging. We said that the packaging is uh, when it comes to design. Engineering, the package design and package engineering and product development, development teams, they determine the most appropriate package material. Which material is suitable to keep the product stable physically and chemically? Is it glass, plastic, or metal? Uh, they choose the material and they choose also the container closure system. Uh, what type of container we use? Bottle, uh, vial, a blister pack, uh, for example, uh, dropper, and so on. Depends on the nature of uh, and the intended use of the product. The product package testing is conducting uh, conducted to ensure the package is not only dispensing the product but also protected from the adverse factors and delivers the functionality, cost parameters, and package specific mar marketing claims. Okay. Um, so we want to be sure that um, so so as we mentioned, the stability testing will be done with the product in the final packaging. So you want to be sure that it is stable during the shelf life. This packaging protect the product. Okay, uh, so it should protect it from any environmental conditions that may adversely affect its stability. For example, if your drug is sensitive to light, then uh, your product sensitive to light, then your packaging must protect it from light, become dark package or dark container. Uh, you use dark container if your product is sensitive to for example, uh, oxygen, whatever, then you should use probably airtight container and so on. Okay. Um, okay, so anyway, the protocol for uh, testing um, this stability in the final package and so on will be discussed in more details when we discuss about the stability testing. Okay, so no need to elaborate much more now. Um, the second, the next stage after developing the product and ensuring it is stable in the final packaging, then we can produce, pass it to the consumers for testing. So consumers use the product as directed in their home environment and answer questions designed to capture the consumer's impressions and experiences. Overall satisfaction with the product and assessment of specific product attributes lead to further improvement to ensure product acceptance. So you may get, uh, by answering these questionnaires, you may get some feedback from the consumers about the product. Maybe they report some side effects or they report some uh, problem with the aesthetic properties of the product, smell, whatever, the color, uh, texture, and so on. Um, uh, if it is much oily, much sticky, whatever. So maybe you need to improve the formulation so that it will be suitable for the consumers. And then, of course, these tests, must you must get approval first before from regulatory bodies before you can 
uh, conduct such uh, studies on human subjects. And then clinical testing or claim substantiation. You have claimed, for example, that this preparation uh, can treat wrinkles or this one can treat dandruff or whatever. Then you have to provide clinical, you have to conduct clinical testing to provide a, a adequate and reasonable substantiation or evidence of the effectiveness of this product. And also you should monitor for side effects which give a uh, uh, an evidence about the safety of the product before you can get uh, permission for marketing of this product. Okay, and uh, how to measure these outcomes related to effectiveness and safety? It can be by subjective or objective measurement. When we talk about objective, means something you have scale, you can measure it with numbers. For example, you are measuring um, uh, hypertension, blood pressure. You are measuring, for example, glucose level. This is, uh, you can use uh, as an instrument or a, a device that can give you readings in numbers. So this is objective measurements. So here we're talking about skin uh, care product. For example, uh, keeping the skin, uh, for example, uh, moisture. So for example, here objective measurement, like measuring by evap uh, evaporometers that assess Transepidermal water loss and dermal torque meters that evaluate skin tensile properties such as elasticity, elasticity and firmness. These devices will give you, or instruments will give you, uh, reading in numbers. So, this is objective measurements. Subjective is something that no scale, just you can grade it, for example, by expert clinical grading, or you ask the patients themselves to, to answer questionnaire and they give. Uh, something uh, from 1 to 10 on a scale from 1 to 10 okay so uh, for example like reporting that it became worse or no change or there is improvement or the condition resolved okay this is subjective measurement uh, based on the measurement of the outcomes then you may have an evidence that this one may improve condition or resolve it or doesn't have effect okay and usually it should be uh, controlled clinical trials. You say controlled clinical trials means that you have two groups of subjects. One of them is the control group. This is what I mentioned before earlier in this lecture that you give them the placebo means the formulation without any active ingredients that claim to produce the benefits. And the other group is the one that will have the formulation with the active ingredients. Because sometimes patients may have some placebo effect. Maybe some improvement will happen due to the base of the formulation itself. So then you want to compare what is the added benefit of the active ingredients you are using in this formulation. Okay. Um, once you prove the benefits and you get a marketing authorization then we can go for manufacturing of commercial batches and manufacturing should go under GMP as we mentioned and then there should be a quality control also to ensure that the product released having the required specifications so if in for manufacturing we have to determine the process parameters which means the manufacturing variables for example um, in this manufacturing process, you are doing some mixing uh, mixing uh, process, we say, for example. Okay, so what are the processing parameters or what are the variables or operating, what, what are the operating uh, parameters for the equipment and to, to do this process? Okay, um, heating, cooling times, shear forces during manufacture, etc. For example, to make it easy or clear for you, we prepared emulsion before in the lab. And we prepared the emulsion using either homogenizer or um, for nano emulsion, we used the, as, uh, the probe syncator, right? Okay, so now imagine in the factory, you will have a uh, a tank with bigger homogenizer and then you are going to put your formulation ingredients the mixture water surfactant and 
um, your lipid phase or oil phase initially. Okay. So now we are doing a homogenization process. We don't call it mixing process. We say homogenization process. So what will be the process parameters? What will be the speed of the homogenizer? And for how long you need to use the homogenizer till you get the uh, homogenization done? You get the emulsion with the required uh, droplet size. Okay, so there will be some tests and there will be some trials during the scale up uh, in order to determine um, those suitable for the industrial scale. So at the beginning, we use homogenizer in the lab, lab scale. Uh, at certain time, for certain period of time, they may this works in the lab, but may not work in the big tanks and big homogenizer in the industrial uh, uh, scale in the manufacturing uh, uh, um, or production department. So once you do the scale up trials, then you have to optimize also. You have to run at different speeds for different time uh, periods and then you determine the outcome, the droplet size and so on uh, till you get the and uh, you get complete homogenization with the required droplet size. Okay. So scale up process begins with a series of lab batches leading to a mid-size pilot plant batch. You increase the batch size gradually uh, till successful full-scale production batch. For example, your tank capacity for the emulsion here is say 200 liters. But in the lab you used to make one liter or 500 ml. So you start to use the minimum amount that can be used in this tank. You increase to for example, 50% filling, filling of the tank and then full tank after this, okay, or full capacity. The final production process is then validated according to current GMP uh, manufacturing practices and quality control testing is conducted to ensure a high quality product. Um, in these cosmeceuticals, we may produce them as classic, formulations and also we may use some nanotechnology in the formulations. Nanotechnology is considered as the science and technology used to develop as you know or manipulate the particles in the size usually uh, 1 to 100 nanometers. can be larger than 100 nanometers. The nanometer scale is considered nanotechnology but mostly we are playing around 100 nanometer plus or minus. Okay. Several benefits can be achieved with the utilization of nanotechnology in cosmeceutical formulations. Examples, uh, nanovesicles may control the release of active ingredient, so it will be effective for longer duration. It can be used to target it at specific sites. Uh, it may have affinity to certain tissues, certain types of cells, so they exert the effect on them. Uh, it may lead to increased efficacy. It may have occlusive properties to so prevent to so protect the, uh, the the active ingredient from uh, degradation in the surrounding vehicle. It may cause some active transport of active ingredients. These nanoparticles may be taken by endocytosis into the cells and tissues to so produce effect. They have high entrapment efficiency. I use them for high, high entrapment efficiency. Sometimes certain nanoparticles uh, of certain nature that can entrap my molecule uh, uh, more efficiently compared to others. Like for example, using uh, solid lipid nanoparticles for lipid soluble drugs. They can entrap, uh, entrap them uh, with high entrapment efficiency. They can take a large amount in the particles compared to, for example, if I use aqueous polymers nanoparticles, okay? And they can cause physical stability, as I mentioned. There are many types of nanoparticles that can be used. As you see here, nanoemulsions, gold nanoparticles, nanospheres, dendrimers, cubosomes, carbon nanotubes, polymersomes, liposomes, neosomes, solid lipid nanoparticles, and nanostructured lipid nanoparticles, or nanocarriers. Uh, I think this has been discussed in more detail with uh, Dr. Mulham in dosage form design. But here we give just some examples about the use of 
this nanotechnology, this nanotechnology in uh, cosmeceuticals. Some antioxidants like carotenoids, coenzyme Q10, lycopene, and vitamin A, E, and K have been incorporated into liposomes, which are used to amplify their physical and chemical stability when dispersed in water. Okay, so they protect them from, uh, if they are dispersed in water, they will have a um, faster rate of degradation. But if they are protected by liposomes, then they are, uh, they, the shelf life is longer. They stay stable for longer duration. Solid lipid nanoparticles as carriers for 3, 4, 5, trimethoxy, benzoyl chitin, and vitamin E sunscreens developed to enhance the UV protection. Perfume formulations also have uh, as solid lipid nano uh, carriers. They have delayed release, so the perfume will stay longer. Okay, so you apply the perfume that contains solid, solid lipid nano carriers, and uh, the ingredient with the perfume ingredient itself that have the smell is encapsulated in these nano carriers. It will be released over a long period of time, so you will retain the perfume smell longer period in your body. Okay, so they are uh, ideal for use in day creams as well that you apply during the day. So for a long time during the day, you will have the smell of the perfume. Nano emulsions, widely used as medium for the controlled delivery of various cosmeceuticals like deodorants, sunscreens, shampoos, lotions, nail enamels, conditioners, and hair serums. Okay, so here we came to, this lecture came to an end. Uh, do you have any questions? Do you have any questions? Um, no, oh. Okay, so then we close the lecture by this slide and then we may see you, inshallah, see you in the next uh, lecture. Have a good day. And assalamu alaikum. Thank you, doctor.